been saying for a long time, you know, it looks like that I might get to preach 300 revivals in my lifetime. And uh, shortly before I had the stroke, and I'm not going to go through those details again, I preached number 300, by the way, and I really figured, well, a doctor was telling me that I'd have to learn to talk and walk again, and he was wrong on both counts. When they let me get woke up, I could do both. But I thought, well, this, this probably about going to be it. Hey, but uh, I'll have preached 50 more. <laughs> and so, who knows? I'm going for 400 now. <laughs> Ain't no way. Methuselah lived to be 969. And I just like 900 years being there. <laughs> It can be done, folks. It's been done. <laughs> I know I may not, but it could be done. <laughs> Thank you all for indulging us and allowing us to come back to Lakewood again. All right, open up your Bible to John, chapter 20, if you would, please. Or chapter 19, I'll get it figured out here in a minute. John chapter 19 and verse 34. Let me read it. We're going to pray. And then I'll try to share with you what God's already put on my heart. And we'll add in any that it seems good to add in as we go. John chapter 19, verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. Whose side? Well, Jesus' side. I always try to preach something about Jesus. Doesn't matter where you start much in the Bible, just head for Jesus. <laughs> and you won't go far wrong. They pierced Jesus' side. And forwith came around blood and water. Would you stand with me as we pray? God, we've laughed a little together and fellowship. And I've read some scripture. Now, unless you help me, God, that's about all we're going to get done here tonight. But with your help, God, if you'll bring to recollection that which you've been talking with me about, and add anything else, God, that you want added to the service, I'll preach your word. And God, there may be those who feel the need to give a testimony. There may be those who you're speaking to, as you did me many years ago, about special service or some kind. There may be those that need to get saved and those that need to unite with this church follow their Lord of baptism. Whatever, God, whatever, Lord, help us that we'd be open and attentive to your leadership. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior. Amen. Amen. All right. May be seated. Lord, Big things have happened in history, haven't they? I mean, a lot of big things. Really, the most important are all mentioned in the Bible. But there have been a lot of important things that have come since Bible times. And you may sometimes find a prophecy that would indicate it's going to happen, but it's not happened to it. I mean, not many things were bigger than creation, I suppose. And there are all kinds of theories and ideas about creation. Some say it happened with a big bang. <laughs> and I've talked to a few of those folks, and I've said, boy, you reckon bang? <laughs> if there wasn't anything before that, boy, reckon bang? And the answer's always the same. Well, I uh, was gaseous. 
like methane or propane gas. And then I say, where do you reckon that came from? <laughs> well, it was just always there. So, of course, then there was something before there was anything. Now, that couldn't be, could it? That there was something before there was anything? And then I say, we reckon the spark came from to set it off. <laughs> and those were unanswerable questions. It takes a whole lot of faith to believe that all created order came out of one big bang and just blew everything into existence. Hey, it takes less faith to believe that God created it and it does to believe that there was nothing and there was something and there must have been a big bang or something that caused it. If you follow that, why, hey, it's a free country, you've got a right to, but I believe that God created everything that is. Yeah. And God set it all in motion, and it's been in motion ever since. That was big. And then certainly that big flood back in the days of Noah. Hey, we get the Colorado flood uh, reported on TV and uh, that really seemed like a big flood. <laughs> they wonder what the news media would say if we had that flood today. They probably wouldn't say anything because most of them be out swimming. <laughs> hey, trying to get in the ark would be too late. Hey, but big events, big events. It was a pretty big event when uh, God cast Adam and Eve out of uh, out of Eden. Said, "You won't be back. You'll never be back in here." In fact. Uh, Adam, you go on. Eat your bread with the sweat of your face, and I'm going to see if there are plenty of thorns and thistles in it. Hey, and that's been true. And Eve, uh, you're going to have pain and conception and childbirth. Your husband's going to be over you. Hey, that was a pretty big event. Hey, there's been some other things, I mean. But I'm going to talk tonight about the biggest thing that's ever happened. Now, it was a big thing when Jesus was born there in Bethlehem, but that's just leading up to the big thing. The biggest thing of all in the plan of Almighty God would be the day that His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would die on the cross for the sin of mankind, and as part of that, that He would arise on the third day, victorious over sin, death, and the grave. Now that's fixed up. They won't report anything on the 10 o'clock news that'll match that. They think their stories are big. Somebody found a lost kitten somewhere. <laughs> but nothing to match what happened there that day long ago. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. We heard quite a bit of talk a week or so ago about a red line in the sand. A red line in the sand over in Syria. And I just got thinking about another red line drawn in the sand. Hey, there's been lots of lines drawn and redrawn. That's 
that's part of the problem over in the Middle East. <laughs> they have such a hard time establishing boundaries, don't they? Now let me tell you something, and it's no secret, and it's not something you've not figured out. Those people in that part of the world have been fighting for hundreds and even thousands of years. They don't think like we do in Western civilization. They have a whole different mindset and philosophy of life. And we never are going to be able to police them and make them do the way we think they ought to be doing. Soon as we get out, we might go in and make everybody put their weapons down, but as soon as we get out, what do they do? They get their weapons and they start fighting again, don't they? Hey, but things have gotten worse than that. I mean, in the past uh, week or so, we've been hearing about how there in Kenya, a mall has been taken over by a group uh, linked to the terrorists. And they've gone through the hundreds of people that were there in that mall and checked them to see if they were Islamists or Muslims. If they said they were, they told them, well, quote part of the Quran. Or say one of the Islamic prayers. And if they couldn't, they killed them. And if they found one that professed to be a Christian or a Jew, they killed him on the spot. We say, now that's pretty bad. What would you do? Or what will you do if you ever come to a day like that? You say, oh, preacher, that'll never happen. I wouldn't be too sure. They have already made their pledge that someday their flag would fly over the capital. They determined to do it. I mean, will there be another 9-11? I surely do hope not. Pray not. Will there be another Fort Hood shooting? Yeah, it probably won't be at Fort Hood, but there'll be something about that here. Will there be another Boston Marathon bombing? Well, I wouldn't be surprised. Will there be another murder, mass murder like at the Washington Naval Center? Could be. The day may very well come if Christ delays his coming where you or your children or grandchildren will be caught in that very same situation. This war on terror is a real thing. It's not going away. Because it's being fueled by rabid followers of a false religion. And they believe it's the right thing to do to kill people like you. And they will. A peaceful religion. My they're not even peaceful with one another, and they're sure not going to be peaceful with us. And we've had presidents for the last 20 years talking about what a peaceful religion they were, and I don't believe a word of it. I don't believe a word of it. That's not what I see. There are probably some peaceful folks among them, but they're not the ones that are in control. I mean, uh, well, the way Campbell looks a little like a jailbird to me. <laughs> What's going to happen 
where it was located. But if they go back to that place, the Garden of Eden won't be there. It, it won't be there no more. Hey, God drew a land on the east side of the garden. But there are some other lines that God has drawn. God has drawn a marriage line. A line of marriage. And uh, it's uh, plainly stated in Genesis chapter 2 that a man should leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they twain or they two would be one flesh. Now that's a man and a woman. It started as Adam and Eve. But that was the line that was drawn. Marriage was limited to be between a man and a woman. But some would say after Jesus changed everything, he certainly didn't change that. In fact, Jesus restated it in the 19th chapter of Matthew, verse 5, Jesus reaffirmed it. Quoting that same line. Man would leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they twain, or they two, would be one flesh. Now let me tell you something that you already know. There's no court in the land that can ever change that land. They may make something legal. But they can't make it right. And that was wrong in Bible days. And it's still wrong today. And it'll be wrong when the trumpet sounds. Because God made that line. And to pretend any other kind of marriage is purely and simple. In disobedience to the law of God. And God, in drawing that line, spelled out what the relationship between a man and a woman should be. He said that the marriage bed was not defiled. But any other kind of relationship even between a man and a woman was adultery, fornication, sin. And God said that. And we can change the name of it and call it a fire. But God would say that's adultery. Or we can call it a trial marriage. God say that sin. And we can try to excuse it by saying, well, that's everybody does that. We uh, are not married, but uh, we have moved in with one another. It's just the same as being a husband and wife, but it's not the same. Because God drew a line. He talked about a man and his wife. He didn't talk about a man and his girlfriend. I'm going to tell you something. I'm preaching to the over the years. I've learned that there are two things that will cause an uproar in the church. Let me tell you what they are. You may be surprised or you may not. When I go to a church and start preaching that the practice of homosexuality 
is wrong in a sin. Sometimes I'll say, if you're living that kind of lifestyle, I'm glad you're at church tonight. But I will tell you, you should never get up and sing in the choir. You must never be teaching a Sunday school class, working with a young people, because you're out of place when you do. That's right. And uh, it's seen. Hey, that kicks back on me pretty often. Remember a couple, three years ago, I was in a church in Kentucky, and I made that same kind of statement. And the next service, the pastor was waiting for me on the front porch. <laughs> and uh, I've learned that's a bad sign. <laughs> preacher, preacher, wait now, I want to have a little talk with you. Be 
Now, let me quickly say a word to it and move on. Draw toward the end. Hey, there's a, there's some things that God said that would be related to that. Proverbs chapter 22. God said, Remove not the ancient landmarks which thy fathers have said. The old standards that have long been sound, solid Bible teaching. The same kind of things that Brother Wade Campbell's daddy would preach. And your mom and daddy and your grandfather because we live in a different day does not in any sense of the word disqualify the old biblical church standards. And then he said to ask for the old facts. Now I don't preach a lot about old fashioned because old fashioned is a matter of some folks 20 years ago was old fashioned, some 50 years ago was old fashioned. I don't care if you come to revival in a buggy full of a horse, or if you drive the car way too fancy for me to afford. I'll get a limousine to bring you. None of that matters one way or other. Often churches will have old fashioned day and they'll come in their old overalls or old bonnets that they never wear any other time. Sometimes they bring the same old attitudes <laughs> just dressed different. <laughs> so I don't say a lot about old fashion. But there are some things. The basic teachings of the Bible just keep on preaching, by the way. Thus saith the Lord. And get your text and your teaching right out of the Scripture, and you'll be getting it right. You'll be getting it right. The world may not like it, but you'll be preaching it right. And I think I know you well enough to know that that's exactly what you've been doing, what you're going to keep on doing. I won't always make you popular. But you'll always be right. There's a line or two that's drawn that God didn't draw. Too many churches have a line drawn right down. I might as well put it right down the middle of the aisle. Their bunch sits on one side and our bunch sits on the other side. And anything they're for, we're against. And anything... We're for or against. Churches get deadlocked as bad as our Congress. Politicians are deadlocked. And God didn't draw a line down the middle of the church and say you ought to, you ought to be fussing about something. You ought to be in disharmony. God talked about being in harmony. I hope you all have the sweetest, sweetest spirit of harmony of anybody in any church anywhere in the state. Boys, I know you do. Boys don't mean anything. But if you've got a line drawn in the church that says your side and my side, it's not drawn there by the blood of Jesus. You've drawn that yourself. You mark that out yourself. If you've got such a line set, that's a man drawn line. It was not drawn there by the blood of Jesus Christ. But that blood that Jesus shed that day on the way to the cross, and as he hanged there on the cross, is the most meaningful line that's ever been drawn. It divides heaven and hell. It divides the way to heaven from the way to hell. And there'll never be any kind of line that'll get you to heaven other than that trail of blood that was made there 
that Jesus shed sheds our love. That blood that Jesus shed says you can have life and have it more blood. That you can die in peace with your eternal destiny already settled. Not by how good you've been. Not by the works of your flesh. Not because that you've been a good person. But that trail of blood is the trail of If you want to go to heaven, go by the way of the blood. What's that old song, Miss Margie? Some do the fire and some do the flood, but all through the blood. Hey. It's that blood, that red line in the sand, that says to our old sinner, Dr. Thurman Savior, you can go to heaven. You can go to heaven. And it says that to you. <coughs> That's the line of lines. Of all the lines that have ever been marked out. That's the one. That's the one you need to know about. Are you a Christian? Has that blood washed away your sin? They tell us Baptists quit singing those old blood songs. Today's world, they don't want to hear uh, bloody cross. Quit singing those old blood songs. But we're not going to quit, are we? God help us if we decide to leave the blood out. I've got to go to Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville for three years, way back, way back, way back even before Brother Wade and I were some amazing grace back. <laughs> One of the professors there, nice talking man, I suspect he loved the Lord, but he made a statement during the class one day that I rejected immediately and I've never changed my mind. He said, you preacher boys, don't you preach so much on the death of Jesus. You preach on the life of Jesus. And I told Professor Stay, that's just not right. Yes, preach on the life of Jesus. I talked last night about how he went to Jericho. But it's the blood that has the power. There's power in the blood. Have you been saved? If you ever get saved, it's going to be through the blood. Have your sins been washed away? It's by the blood. The blood. Our musicians going to come right now. And if God is dealing with your heart about anything, Becoming a member of this church, rededicating your life, being baptized, getting saved. Why don't you do it tonight? As we stand and sing the hymn of the invitation, would you just make your way down to this altar? Would you come on right now?